Okay. Bye bye. Yeesh. It's always something. Don't you know this is the one day John's not here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> this is the one day my husband, John Anderson, is not here. And this stupid thing is going crazy over here. Okay, so let me get messages going. And we will start off. We got a full stinking show today. Okay? I'm having a hard time finding your comments. But I see that you're logging on, so that makes me very, very happy. I figured out what happened last Friday, was it? Yeah, Friday with Michael Thorpe. I don't know if you guys know, but we have a new kitten. <laughs> okay. And so I think, I think she tromped across my um, keyboard and up at the very top of my computer, I didn't know that that was another place where sound could not work and somehow the sound got turned off. So... So this is my plan today. We have really good stuff, all right? Um, first, we're going to do Ellen Lindner, and I'll talk about her in a moment. And then I'm going to do uh, Michael Thorpe at the end, because I know some of you went and found it as your homework assignment, but I know some of you didn't. And so it's important to me that we, as quilt makers around the globe, understand who this young man is. So that's what we're going to do. That came to me this morning. So good morning. All right, what do we have going on here? Oh, I was going to show you what I'm working on. Let me go grab something. Oh, my gosh. The thing, the thing is when you're doing a Sue Spargo, like, little quilt thing or something, um, I think it's important to have more than one going <laughs> because I just started another one. <laughs> so I saw this um, in Mendocino, and I'm so mad at myself that I didn't write down the gal's name, but this was really inspiring to me, and I'm not quite sure what medium it is, but um, that those background colors I would never in a million zillion put together. So I did the best I could with wool, and then I went to Sue Spargo's um, Fresh, the one with the flower book, and pulled out some flowers, but this is what I'm working on now. And I got to tell you, I had that, yeah, I don't know if any of you noticed it, but I had this background hanging up on my um, wall for a while, and I was really intimidated by those colors. But I think it's, it's, it's coming along. I'm having fun with that, okay? Oh, and the other thing is, if you didn't know, my kitten went viral. Heidi went viral. Yes, she did. Uh, John put up a video of her just going, running around this stupid ball thing, and it had... It's reached like 15 million and views have been 8 million. My cat went half viral. So we, so we said, okay, we're going to do it again. Okay, now we're addicted, right? So there's one out there now with her on my Q20 and her tail is swishing. A lot of people, and I'm quilting, I was very aware of her tail and I was going very slow, but it was, she's, hey, she, it's a, uh, there's a tag that hangs on you when you get a Bernina, like who inspected it. So she's whopping away at it and I'm sewing. So no, I was, and if you go look at that video again, my hands are placed so that I am looking above and I'm sewing about a stitch an inch. <laughs> I mean, a, a stitch a minute, super, super slow. So, okay, here we go. It, oh, and I potty trained her. Yes, I did. We were having a bad time with that. And I found that when I go in to use the facilities, I bring her with me and she does her thing. This cat's weird. I love this cat. She's half human. Okay, so I got a couple things I wanted to share with you before we um, get into today's video. So this is Suzanne, or Nana. I got the notes here. Um, this is her uh, grandbaby, Cameron. Guess who's coming up here? And Cameron came by for the weekend, and they did it. And I suggested that. And this just fits in so beautifully with the Libby Williamson show and then the thing I'll be showing on Michael in a little bit. Um, but she 
she, she, I suggested to Nana that they just glue it down like how Freddie does. And I think Nana might have stitched the hair in place, but then they just did straight line quilting um, across it, you know, not obviously every inch or whatever. But I think that's one happy kid. And you could tell the things that she loves. So Suzanne, thank you so much. And thank you for going the extra mile on getting me a larger image. I super appreciate it. Okay, then we have Barbara. And Barbara made this spinning spools quilt for a, well, no, she made it, wasn't really thrilled with how it was turning out. And then she needed a, a, a quilt for a 15 year old. So she put the cat on the bottom left hand corner, and that's a duplicate of their cat. And then here is the bat, there's a kitty. And great job, by the way. Um, and then she put, paw prints on the back. So I thought that was really super cool. And then Sandra dropped in from Calgary in um, Alberta, Canada, and they have the uh, largest outdoor quilt show on the west side of Canada. And so on the western side, oh my, <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Of which I believe one is hers. Oh, that just made me smile this morning. Okay. And then she put her spinning spools outdoors too. I just love, love that. So, um, oh, we have Brazil here. Awesome. So we're going to have two videos today. All right. We're going to start with Ellen Lindner, who her show aired about a month ago. It is an absolute must watch show. After we do hers, I will um, thank you all for coming, but then I'm going to show from my lips to God's ears, Michael Thor Thorpe's. We're going to have a double, a double matinee today. Okay. And so Ellen, going back to Ellen, um, she we found her on the Global Quilt Connection. It was a, a database put together of people who want to teach, and um, we were very impressed with her. After she came on the show, I was a little smacked, God smacked by her, God smacked, because she really, she really has a way of getting people crossing the bridge of being a traditionalist to an art quilter. I did get an email the other day from somebody saying, don't forget us traditional people because I'm kind of going on this weird journey and I don't know what I'm doing, but I won't. I mean, tradition is in my bones, in my bones. I just want to try all sorts of different things and I want to expose myself to as many different uh, jumping jacks as I can do just to broaden my own quilting experience. So let's go take a look at the video that we that I made uh, with her with Ellen Lindner. I just, it's fabulous, you guys, just fabulous. Hi, Ellen, how are you today? I'm great, thanks for having me. I love Ellen Linder, adventurequilter.com. So right. I, wanna, I wanna talk about um, when you were on TQS, what was it, about a month ago maybe? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, it was show number 3007, and people really went kind of nuts over it. Oh, that's nice to know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so if you haven't watched the show, you guys, here's kind of a, a recap of it, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you talk in the show about what you did, and you now are an art quilter, but to, for people to jump over that chasm is huge. You broke it down, A, B, C, one, two, three, right? Well, that was my, my goal, yes. So when you teach people, like, um, what are some of the classes that you teach that take people across that bridge? Um, one of them is my class, Floral Improv. And let me just talk right here for a second about choosing the class that's right for you. So for instance, my class Floral Improv has got improv in the name. So if you're the type that is only happy with precision points and making the same project as everyone else in the class, a class with improv in the name is probably not your best bet. On the other hand, if you are wanting to stretch and you need 
some guidance. You're like, I want to make an art quilt, but I don't know where to start. Then maybe a class like that with a little improv thrown in would be a good idea for you. So first of all, choose a class well, read all the stuff, read the supply list. Do you have to know how to do free motion quilting in it? You know, do those kinds of things so that you can choose um, a class that's going to work well for you. And then realize that in any learning situation, we are going to feel a little bit out of our uh, our comfort zone. And that's normal. That's that's part of learning. Um, I'm trying to teach myself to cook a little bit better. I read this uh, book that's sort of like a textbook. It had 40 pages on salt. And it's everything from, I know, everything from the types of salt to when to use the salt to how much salt to should you put it in a brine, should you just sprinkle it on, blah, blah, blah. So I've read those 40 pages, but I won't own that information. I won't be comfortable with that information until I've had a chance to use it a lot. And so I've got to be comfortable with that. I know that. I know it's going to take me a little while to get comfortable with that. And that's okay. So just count on your teacher and you know, use someone who's reputable, maybe that you've heard about. Choose a good class and, and put your, your faith in that teacher that they can get you over those humps. That would be my first, first bit of advice. Now, when someone takes your class, um, and you do, you guys, she teaches a lot online, and you can find her at adventurequilter.com. Um, what, what sort of mental hurdles do people come with? They, I often get comments like um, a student will email, email me, look, cannot talk, email me and say, I knew that there was no way I could do this class, and my friend Peggy felt the same way. So we just decided that we would sit together and we would commiserate and, and we would be the class dunces together. <laughs> However, Fabulous. we both had beautiful projects at the end of the class and we're really happy and, and you're, a, you're a great teacher, you know. So they come in with a lot of fear sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I can usually work past that. I think the, the key there for a teacher is to give your students some success. You know, start with the basics, let them have success at that. That was a new thing, but hey, that wasn't too scary. And then what's the next new thing and have some success and, and go ahead and, and uh, build on that. Well, let's take a look at this first quilt that you sent me, uh, which by the way, I adore. And if I were a newbie at this, I'd go, I can't do that. I can't do that. And what is wrong with us that we play these stupid mental games? You know, come on. I, you know, I don't know because... Any skill we have, we had to learn. We had to learn how to ride our names and ride a bike and, and everything that we've ever done. So this is the sample for the, the class that I mentioned early, earlier called Floral Improv. And so we start with the easiest thing. That's going to be the round daisies. Okay, that's not too challenging. Let's go on to the oval daisies. All right, that wasn't too scary. And maybe these little... Um, little bud kind of daisies not too bad all right now let's go on to these poppies they're a little bit more complex but now i think i'm feeling pretty confident i think i can handle those and then finally we talk about composition and focal point and how to arrange the flowers and so forth so that progression then is easy for the students to to accept and to deal with and to to master. Everybody does well in that class. They have no problem, you know, in that class. And if I recall in shooting the show, and I watched it a while back, um, we even get into things like, okay, placement, good design, poor design. And it's really right. super easy, you guys. I mean, it was just the comments on your show. It's just like was a, a, a was good. great. Congratulations. Right. Good, wow. good. Yeah, there's some real easy guidelines that you can follow. Once you know them and, you know, it works out pretty well. Okay. So insp inspiration can come in the oddest places. Yes. And so, <laughs> you know, Who's boy, do I look girl? there. That's only about 40 years ago. So, um, you know, this is the beginning of my color class. And I start off talking about copying color. There's no rule that says you have to invent some color combination that no one else has ever used. So this is a shirt that I liked, and I decided I would borrow those colors to make a baby quilt. Okay, so if you want to show the next one, we'll see the resulting 
quilt. Look at that. And so there's a baby quilt. And I took that shirt to the store with me. Oh. Now, by the way, this was like 1990. There were there were no quilt shops in my area. And the um, fabric store had mostly cotton polyester blends. Oh. Didn't have too many cotton fabrics you know so this was all you know i've been quilting a while so i've been through join the club okay yeah, but right right but hey ellen let me let me comment on something on this um the ratio of the color you right. used is not what is in the shirt like you've got a light a lot of white in there which i think is interesting yeah. if this quilt is that old because that's so in yeah. right now yeah yeah it could be and uh the pattern had a light background so that influenced me um, in that regard. And actually, Alex, you know, the white is the most important color in this, even though we don't really call it a color, it's a neutral because without it, you know, none of the rest of that would show up. So the white is, the white is important. And so, yes, I did use it in a much larger ratio. And sometimes that's the case from your inspiration and sometimes it's not, you know, but either way, you can use that inspiration. You can cheat just a little bit. Uh, you don't have to, um, completely invent the color wheel, shall we say. Mm -hmm. I, I just think this is just fabulous. And I know Thank I'm you. pretty dependent on the color wheel. Um, and I, back in the day, Diana McClun, who was a mentor of mine, would say, take a, a photograph or a picture and then use that. That blew my mind. But with this shirt here, it makes complete, total sense. You know, you know, and maybe, right, maybe you have a scarf, you have a favorite pillow, you know, we all have favorite items that have some colors in them, and they can all be inspiration for, for the next quilt, even a lovely uh, multicolored fabric, we can pull all the colors from that, and those could be the colors from our next quilt. Yes, yes. Now, that works as well. now, this next before and after is certainly a notch up a little bit. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And by the way, yeah. excuse the phone. That was, um, you know, I was showing Ellen our kitten, and that was its birth, not its birth mother, <laughs> its car mother. So excuse that. Okay, so oh, that's okay. yeah, look at this, and this is the case of always having a camera with you. Beautiful. Yeah, and aren't we aren't we lucky to have our yes. cameras on our phones these days? So this was um, a picture that I took. And let me tell you the process before we look at the next photo. Sure. Um, often when I'm dealing with my students, especially when we get to my hardest class called Design Your Own Nature Quilt, they literally kind of can't see the forest for the trees. And we're trying to simplify shapes and abstract shapes. So one way to do that is to tear from magazine pages, and I'll, which is what I did with this photo. Because you're tearing to make your composition, I make a composition about typing paper size. Because you're tearing, you can't be exact. So you can only capture the main thing. So you can capture the mountain and the sky and some of the trees, but then maybe you're gonna have to be uh, a little bit interpretive when it comes to the road or some other things. I, I did actually- that again. I want to look I again. I cheated and used my scissors for the, for the trees. But let's go ahead and look at the next one. And this is one magazine's worth of images that I um, tore apart. Okay. And then, and then I was able, so here's, here's the image. So, you know, this is just a fun exercise. I like to do it every now and then just when I'm kind of like, hey, I don't, know, I don't know what to do for my next project. Let me play with one of these. And it's just so much fun. And look at the wacky stuff. You've got text in the sky and, and there's drapery fabric in the, on the snow on the mountains and different things like this and different stripes that have been used to make the trees. This would make a killer quilt design. If you made a quilt like this, you know, it would be very interesting and yeah. everybody would, would, you know, tap you on the back, pat you on the back and say, oh, you know, you're so creative. How'd you get those abstract shapes or something? But sometimes just something as simple as limiting yourself physically, tearing magazine pages, you're not gonna be able to be exact. And that's a good way for you to focus in on shape. So that's so, why I included that one in there. Okay. So to be, to be clear, cause I'm, my man, mine was going one way now it's going the other way. You have this picture that you took from your car and then you mm -hmm. go to magazines and you say, Oh, I need blue. And then you tear it up. Oh, I need right. tree stuff. And then you tear up green and stuff like that. Right. Right. Fun. So, right. Just go through one magazine, whatever one magazine will yield for me. So if it doesn't have the right things, which it will, 
But if it didn't have the wrong things, I would have to get creative. And that's, that's part of the process. So sometimes I'll have the students, that's actually their homework at the end of, at the end of class. But um, that class does take a little more courage, design your own nature quilt. And I put in the supply list, uh, you don't need artistic skills, but you do need artistic courage. So they know up front, yes, it's, it's going to take you a little bit outside your comfort zone. So be sure you pack your artistic courage, you know, and then I, I give them forewarning. All right, now this is where you're going to need that courage and, and we work on something. But they do really well. They, they just get really wonderful results. And I think I showed some of those examples on the show. Um, in the show yeah. that I did. Yeah. yeah. So here's a question. Okay. If, um, if somebody wanted to take a class from you and let's say they're so traditional. Okay. What, what, what would you say should take number one, which one? Probably I would take a class called double reverse applique, which is a killer apple image. I didn't send that to you. That's okay. Everybody makes, everybody makes the same project, but it's a completely new technique. So that's a good starting point. You're doing a new technique, but you know, you're not having to draw your own apple, for instance. So it's not too far. Uh, not too scary. Norm. And then probably floral improv, the one that we saw with the different colored flowers. And I have several others that are kind of in that vein and color, for instance, color, we make a workbook. It's not sexy. You don't have anything to hold up at show and tell at the end. You know, <laughs> we make a workbook and the thing that's useful about that is the making of the work, workbook. Yes, it's a resource, but the fact that the students had to make it. And again, we use magazine pages and paint chips and well, oh, we have a lot of fun. There's, there's paper all over the room, you know? And so we make a workbook and that's, that's a good class for any level, you know, that's not scary. That's just you know, fun. Any, that is just Oh, fun. any of us can work with paper and glue. Yeah. Glue stick, you know, that's, that's not scary. You know, and then the last one, which is design your own nature quilt. That's the one that requires that artistic courage. So that's my I, favorite one to teach, of course. I've taken a couple classes where they have you do paperwork at first. And, and for some reason, leaving your fabric behind and going to that paperwork is liberating yes and and my class um design your own nature quilt they're gonna have to make some design decisions using they bring their own photo everybody has a different photo and we're gonna try to turn it into a quilt at the end so it's it's a lot of content but the first two hours they work only with my photos so they don't have that preciousness of oh my right. gosh i can't write my photo i can't get this you know, so here, try this photo. Oh, here, try this photo. Let's do this exercise. And so by the time we get to their photo, which is about lunchtime, you know, now they're well versed in the skills that we're going to be using. And it's, it's not as scary. So same kind of thing. Let's, let's not get to the meaty stuff. Right. Know, we're we're baby meat. step, baby step, baby yeah, step. Lay the, lay the groundwork, lay the groundwork. Exactly. That, uh, exactly. That you, that you need. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much. And everybody, you're going to want to watch um, Ellen's show. It's 3007. The best thing to do is put it up in the search bar. And um, I'd like to think I have a little bit of art chops. And I, I learned a lot from you. A lot. Good. Good. Okay. If we have time, can I tell you real quickly about why my website is called adventurequilter.com? Yes. When we were newlyweds, I would try out all these wacky recipes and and you know casseroles and food processes or and all this stuff and i made some really not so great stuff and so my husband called them adventure meals whenever i tried something new that was an adventure meal <laughs> so these days i make adventure quilts because i'm always trying something new so that's the adventure love it for me love it love it trying something new. <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much and i look forward to seeing you somewhere now one last quick thing and then we gotta go um do you travel and teach now I do. Okay. I do. Um, yeah. The, the Zoom has got me a little bit spoiled. I have to admit it's, it's kind of handy to teach from home, but I, I am traveling as well. I like to teach from home too. So any, or take classes from home. So anyways, yeah. I got to go. Um, someone else is knocking on the green room door and <laughs> have a great day. Okay. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Wasn't that great? I mean, she's just 
Mm. Two things stuck out to me on, on this interview. And of course, you know, I do it, but then I forget and then I watch it is when she uh, did this, uh, the salt the analogy. I mean, you can talk all about it, but until you get in there and dig into it, forget it. You got to do it. Um, and also artistic courage. I think even in, whenever you go off even a traditional pattern, it's courage. All right. And I would say, uh, Joyce, who just asked, what skills are you, are needed? <clears throat> I would start with her beginning class and just go from there and see, you know, um, I've taken so many classes in the course of my uh, quilting lifetime. And one of, one of the things that can happen, it actually happened to Margaret Miller's uh, sh uh, class at Asilomar, who I love and adore, and we have a show with her. I realized I would never work that way. But that's okay too, you know? I mean, just try these different things. So again, you're gonna wanna see Ellen's show. Um, before we go on to Michael, I wanna remind you that Friday, it's going to be um, Barbara Black, Block of the Month, and then Saturday, it's D again. And then on Monday, I, I decided what I'm gonna do um, as far as quilting this Neutrals quilt is go get close-ups and evaluate what Diane did, Schweikert, who did the quilting on it. And I'm going to tell you she did an A-plus job, but there are some different things she did you might want to be aware of. So we're going to do that next Monday, okay? Um, all right. So also, um, I, the cat's going crazy here. So I'm going to make a quilter out of her if it kills me. Kitty! Oh, look, you can look at her behind. That's not very lovely. <laughs> So for those of you that have seen the Michael Thorpe um, interview, you're excused. Um, I'll see you Monday. But if you haven't seen the Michael Thorpe thing, let's stick around from my lips to God's ears. I can make this work today. And I'm going to keep this cat off the keyboard. So let's see. This is what came up earlier, and I almost started crying this morning. Okay, i got to get rid of that. Okay. Then I go over here. And let's see, I go here and I push, play. I definitely would consider myself an artist first um, that uses textiles, uses quilts. I want to explore all the limitations within quilting and see what I can and can't do, pushing images and text to the boundaries. Michael is an artist, definitely fearless. He breaks the rules of quilting. That's why his quilting is standing out. I've figured out my style. It's dealing with all these shapes and colors. But it all comes together. And it's just very authentic. I was an oddball, you know? I mean, uh, you probably don't know male quilter unless you're in the industry, but there are a lot of male quilters, but then black male quilters, it gets really slim. He went to Emerson, um, studied photography, and then he started looking at artists, not necessarily quilt artists, painters and things, and artists that inspired him. So Jean Michelle Basquiat is like probably easily one of the uh, greatest artists of the 20th, 21st century. So after I was looking at him, biggest thing I realized is like art is all about being authentic. Like you gotta be who you are. And then all of a sudden one day he just did, I think it was his self portrait and it was just right. It just all clicked, you know, it's like, it was super interesting to take a photo of myself and reimagine it into this. Luckily I have, uh, some may say a fantastic head of hair so that I could play around with that. Like I can make that any shape I want. It really like showed me the possibilities using shapes. Like alone, they don't mean anything, but when you add them all together, it comes to this face. Photography was my first avenue of art and I learned so much. Ultimately, it taught me how to see the world. I look at a photograph and then like say this one specifically is my good friend Michael, who is very photogenic. And so the whole collection of pieces is basically that exploration of like looking at photos, seeing how I see them, and then interpreting them into the works that are, have been depicted now. This is a uh, photo of my good friend Pinitnan, 
and she had this photo where it was literally her whole face covered the photograph. It's just the whole piece is her face, and I think it came out really well. And same goes for uh, Zeke, with another good friend from Atlanta. This is actually a piece of my partner, Cecilia Garrett, and this is where she lives now in Brooklyn. Exploring the idea of what to highlight and why to highlight it is very fascinating to me. And I think definitely going forward, it's gonna be a, just a constant puzzle that I'm constantly building with each new piece. When you're staring at the quilts and looking at all those colors, you're realizing the things behind them. There's a lot to them and they, they speak a lot of words. And in few places can we find so many quilts with so much flair pieced in bold, improvised geometries from salvaged cotton and fabric. I'll look at a photo. And I will just start sketching. My approach is inspiration and like figuring out what photo I want to use because all it's based in photos or text. Then I sketch the photo out using my style that I've developed over the years. And then after that, I like basically piece it like almost like a puzzle mosaic type where I cut out the fabric and piece it on top of each other. And after I iron that all down, it's ready to go into my machine where I end up the final leg of it where it's just stitching it all down. So go time. All right, just let's get a quick measurement so we know what we're looking for. My mom, yo, my mom's best. She's a master. She's a perfectionist. My sister owns a quilt shop. I'm a quilter. I teach up there, so you know he's immersed in it. Just to be blunt, like it's just women like my mom, you know, middle-aged white women. So I was just like, hey, come here, and I mean, they just took me in. Michael, at a very young age, actually made a quilt when he was about eight years old. He loved my sewing machine, so I let him do it. He entered it in a quilt show and got a participation ribbon, and. That was the last quilt he made for many, many years because he's a basketball player and basketball took over his life. And that's all we did for many, many years was basketball. The time you've dedicated to this sport, just perfecting these little things, and it's the same goes for art. Like, you just gotta really dedicate, lock in, and, um, no matter how tedious it is, if you really want to do it, you have to work at it. So this is a portrait of Allen Iverson, who played for the Sixers and was an iconic basketball player. I mean, very influential to me. This one was, is, is really important to me because it like opened the floodgates to making art about basketball, which you like, for the longest time, for whatever reason, I couldn't. And now it's just like, now it's just going. So it's very nice. Once I had my first show and there was like this avalanche of things that came out of that show, aside from like actually being able to make money from it, it was like people were like interested in me. With the amazing success of his show, I think he can definitely break into the art world. I know um, several museums have talked to him. That couple who came in Friday night. Oh I yeah, did yeah. The tour with mm -hmm. one of them works at Mass Art. Oh and okay. The other one works um, at a startup in Cambridge. Nice. Which is, uh, Just knowing Michael beforehand, him as a basketball player, as a photographer, um, as a human. Just watching his trajectory and that story behind it, I think that's really special, and I think that's. Um, what makes these, uh, these quilts really come alive. This is like one of, if not the showstopper, which is uh, my sister Latoya, 
who actually came to the show, which was like really meaningful for me to see her and then see her and her little daughters interact with it. And it was really cool. He did a piece of my son, um, Brandon, that was hanging at the show. And he did it just with, just with the stitching. It's, you know, and it had the shape of his beard and it was just amazing. I was walking around at the gallery and I was just like looking at everything, obviously. And uh, I look up and I see a picture of a bearded fellow and I was like, oh, I kind of like that one. <laughs> and then I noticed a little squiggly line on the wrist and a little band on the forearm. And I was like, oh, damn, that's me. <laughs> you know, so I thought, I thought that was really cool. I really did. Um, and I appreciate that, by the way. Absolutely, absolutely. I have this style, I'm using this medium. And now it's just about cranking out more work. If there's an interest, there's an appetite for it, you can't fake the funk. I noticed that like after doing pieces, showing them and talking about them, like it doesn't matter what you're talking about, at least you're authentic about whatever it is. That's the most important. Isn't that great? <laughs> isn't that just great? And isn't that interesting? that he talked about courage too and just digging in and doing it. So actually, I didn't think about that when they both ended up. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, well, I, I don't know what's going on. John's not here. So uh, I will see you guys next week. And I'll talk about my next project. <laughs>